Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to have Don Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, State Councillor of uh, Myanmar, uh, with us uh, this morning. Uh, thank you. Um, I remember um, after uh, 15 years in house arrest, uh, Professor Klaus Schwab and I had the pleasure of meeting with you 2010-2011, uh, and there was a lot of optimism uh, in Myanmar. And uh, also after your landslide elections in 2005, and um, consequently, 15. Uh, 15. Um, thank you. Um, it was a test this morning. <laughs> and um, in 2015, you took over as a state councillor in 2016. Um, and uh, looking at uh, a little bit more than two years, you have now been state councillor. What are you um, most um, of your achievements? What would you say that you have uh, you're most proud of having achieved? And what uh, is the thing um, you would have liked to achieve that you haven't achieved so far? I don't know whether. Pride is the word that I would use, but satis satisfied perhaps. Although not full satisfaction, because I think you always aim higher. Uh, that is how it goes when you're trying to build up a country that has been left behind for many, many decades and you're trying to catch up. But I think if I have to give just one answer, I would say it's uh, the way in which our people have been quick to grasp the, the, the new opportunities that have emerged. Not everybody, of course. You can't expect everybody to be able to, uh, to, to put their hands firmly on the new opportunities. But young people, uh, they have changed. And, and also, I have to say, our civil servants, not because I, some of our civil servants are here, but I think over the last two years, we have started seeing a change in them. I'm not just talking about corruption. It's about also about the fact that they feel uh, more confident and uh, they feel that they can uh, take initiative much more and that they will be listened to and that they are part of the, the, the whole endeavor. So I suppose people, it's the sense that our people have greater confidence in themselves mm. that, that I find most satisfactory. Mm. But what remains to be done, there's so much that I can hardly choose one to talk about. So um, Myanmar used to be uh, the rice bowl of uh, uh, Southeast Asia. That was a long time ago. Yeah, and it yeah. also had one of the best educational systems um, in the region. Um, when, when do you think um, you will see uh, real results, for example, in the educational field? You mentioned yesterday in your speech that, for example, the access um, to the internet has gone from 3% to 25%. Have you seen uh, positive developments also on the educational side the last years? Yes, I, I'm very, uh, I have to say I'm a little surprised and very encouraged by the fact that our young people are very creative and innovative in spite of the fact that we've had a very poor education system and we have put hardly next to nothing into research. And uh, while we're about it, I'd like to uh, invite entrepreneurs to invest in our young people, to invest in research in, in uh, Myanmar. I'd like to give a small example. The, a few weeks ago, I went to an exhibition of little, little projects that, that had been uh, put together by our young people. And it is all research. And of course, they have hardly, we, we, we cannot give much money for research. And yet there, was one, there were a number of very interesting projects, and one that struck me was very simple, but I think this is the sort of thing that we should encourage and that we should invest in. We have a tree called the cocoa. I was going to look up the botanical name, I forgot. So I, don't, I, I can't tell you what the botanical name is, but it's a very beautiful shade tree. It grows very tall, and it's naturally symmetrical. It's like a big umbrella. And it's one of uh, the, 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 the best loved shade trees uh, in, in our country. But apart from providing shade, we've always taken it for granted that it has no other use because the fruit of the cocoa tree is unusable. In fact, at one time we thought it was a bit of a nuisance because when we used to have these 
trees on the roadside uh, in the days when um, uh, windscreens were not made of very tough glass and uh, a cocoa fruit fell on a windscreen, screen, it would be broken. So it was considered something of a nuisance. But these young people had been doing research uh, uh, and producing ethanol from cocoa, cocoa fruit. And this kind of research uh, makes me very happy because um, they are seeing with new eyes which things that have been there all the time and which have been ignored. So I think that's the essence of research, essence of creativity and innovation, that they have the ability to see all things with young new eyes. And I wondered whether some uh, enterprising businessmen might, might not like to invest in, in the research to find out whether ethanol produced from the cocoa uh, uh, fruit could become um, uh, uh, profitable commercially. So, uh, Dan and Sushi, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, international CEOs uh, also with us uh, here, and uh, I think last year you saw um, foreign direct investments a little bit around 10 billion uh, US dollars. Are you welcoming more investments, and in which areas do you want more foreign investments? Uh, we are welcoming, of course, more investments and better investments, and we also uh, accept that we have a responsibility to make the kind of changes that would attract more of the kind of investments we want. We want, of course, I've just talked about education, so obviously what we want is uh, investment in education long term, research in, in our people, in our young people, but also in agriculture, in the agricultural sector, because uh, Myanmar is still predominantly an agriculture country. As you know, about 70% of our people live in the rural area. They are now, there's now a movement towards uh, the cities to, to find jobs, which is, I suppose, to be expected. But we have so much potential in the agriculture sector. And as people talk a lot about the importance of food security over the coming, uh, over the coming years, we would, uh, well, I, I like to think that our country could become uh, what they call an agri-based industrialized nation, like, for example, New Zealand. Like the rice bowl again? Well, no, not the rice I think uh, diversification. I think yeah. we can't just stick to rice. Yeah. But uh, we must diversify and then, of course, uh, we want to go up the value chain with regard, regard to food production. Because in the end, whatever other things we may invent it, food starts from the earth. Mm. You, 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 you may process it in uh, any number of stages, but basically it has to come up. Even if it's meat, the, 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 the animals have to eat whatever comes up from the earth. Following the landslide elections, uh, your landslide in 2015, and uh, then now having been a state councillor um, for um, two years, has it been very different than you anticipated? No, because, uh, because if you look back, we've been in politics for about 30 years. And politics is politics. People seem to think that politics in opposition are different from politics in office. Well, of course, there are different sorts of responsibilities, but in the end, it's working with people. Unless you work with the people, you cannot, you cannot help a country to achieve sustainable development. And we have um, recently a lot, uh, completed our Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan. And uh, that is what we're working towards. But sustainable development is something that we have always been working towards, even when we were not in government. So um, one of uh, the uh, important topics for you when you were in opposition I came into the parliament in 2012 by the, uh, in the by-elections and also uh, before uh, was uh, the role of the military uh, in the parliament. Uh, follow, uh, as a result of your constitution, the military have 25% of the MPs uh, in the parliament. You're having new elections in 2020. Do you see any chance uh, for a change in the constitution so all the MPs will be elected by the people and not 25% by the military? We had um, 
um, uh, um, debate in the, in the legislature in 2000 and I think 14, 2014 about, uh, about the constitution, amendments to the constitution. And uh, uh, this, this is a long debate which, which went on for uh, several weeks. And there we presented our official stand with regard to the constitution. We were very, very frank about the parts of the constitution that we thought should be changed. And uh, we stated that 25% unelected parliamentarians was not in line with democratic values, and this has to change. And that all uh, legislators should be elected freely by the people. Uh, and, but we also made the point that in the interests of national reconciliation and stability, we would negotiate this step by step, that we wouldn't, uh, there, there were some people who, uh, who recommended what they call uh, amending the constitution on the streets, which is to say going out and having demonstrations and, uh, and starting a movement that would force uh, a change in the constitution. But this has never been part of the policy of the NLD. I think very, very few people realize that during our 30 years as a political party, we have not once organized a public demonstration. We have tried to do everything within the framework of the law because we believe that uh, rule of law is absolutely essential for the st stability of our country, for the security of our people. So. We said, no, we were not going to amend the constitution on the streets. We would do it through negotiation uh, within the lawful channels. But this was something that uh, we, we were very open about. And the military knows that we do not accept the unelected 25%. And we will want to negotiate a change step by step. Mm -hmm. So this will be interesting uh, to follow. Um, another... Um challenge for Myanmar is of course related to the officially 135 uh, different ethnical groups and there is still uh, conflict uh, with some of them. Um, the last years uh, there has been a lot of focus on the situation uh, in the Rakhine state and this is a question that you um, also uh, get uh, very often and I think last year you committed uh, to also uh, repatriate a million uh, people that fled from the Rakhine state uh, to uh, Bangladesh. Um, what, what is the time uh, table for this uh, repatriation? Well, the first uh, repatriation was supposed to have started in, on the 23rd of January. But at that time, Bangladesh said they were not, right, they were not ready yet. Yeah. So because we signed an MOU on the 23rd of November um, in 20... Um, wait a minute, we're 20... 18, so that is in it's 2017. <laughs> and so, but uh, uh, that was when it was supposed to have started. So it's, as, as there are two countries involved, we can't alone decide when the repatriation has to begin because mm -hmm. they have to come back from Bangladesh. We cannot go and fetch them from Bangladesh and we have to uh, accept them at the border in, in line with the agreements in the uh, memorandum of understanding. So how, how do you feel about uh, this um, uh, situation um, with uh, the Muslim minority that has fled to Bangladesh, uh, Rohingyas or Muslim uh, minority? Uh, do you feel that the military in uh, Myanmar has handled this uh, well or would you have no in hindsight uh, seen this handled uh, in a different way? Because there is been a lot of international focus and also the UN has come out with pretty strong statements on this. Well, yes, I, I know there has been a lot of international focus, but when you say how did the military handle it, I, I think perhaps you are, uh, I was thinking of the military aspect of the operations because, of course, the political aspect is something for which the government has to take responsibility. Mm. And as uh, uh, I, I like to say from time to time, Although we only have 75% of the power, we have to accept 100% of the responsibility. That's what elected government is all about. Um, there, there, there are, of course, ways in which we, with hindsight, might think that the situation could have been handled better. 
but we believe that for the sake of long-term stability and security, we have to be fair to all sides. The rule of law must apply to, ev to everybody. We cannot choose and pick uh, whom should be protected by the rule of law. And I have to keep repeating because people are, very few are interested in that aspect of the situation, that in the Rakhine there are many, many small groups, ethnic groups, and religious groups, and they're not just the Muslims and the Rakhines, as seems to be the perception of much of the world. For example, we have very small ethnic groups which are fast disappearing, but nobody seems to be interested in them, and yet they are the ones who could disappear altogether, because some are now down to four figures. And, uh, for the government, we have to be fair to all of them, even if the rest of the world is not interested in the smaller groups. We have to make them feel and understand that they will be treated on an equal basis and that their rights and their security matter as much to us as that of the Rakhines and the Muslims, which are the big groups and of whose presence and whose problems the whole world is aware. Mm. So this is, uh, if, if you like, this is part of the responsibilities of a uh, duly elected government. You, some people, a, a democratic government is never elected by 100% of the voters. But you have a responsibility to all, even the ones that did, did not vote for you. So, but, but when uh, the Rakhine state is, is a big state, uh, it's a big, big area, but also as a humanitarian and as a human being, if you look at uh, the burned buildings and the situation for children and, and women uh, following what has happened there, I, I think it also touches you as a human being, uh, this thing. Well, this is, the, this is the very reason why one of the first things that my government did when we took up uh, the responsibilities of admin administration was to organize a central committee for development and rule of law in the Rakhine. And this is well before the first terrorist attacks which launched the latest round of problems. Uh, and uh, when we asked Dr. Kofi Annan to form a commission to help us with this, again, nothing had taken place. Uh, the, the terrorist attacks had not occurred and the problems had not arisen. But we, we saw from then that we needed uh, to do something to ensure that there would be sustainable peace and prosperity in the Rakhine. We were very aware of that and this is what we started to do immediately. But then. After the first terrorist from, uh, attacks in October 2016, then some of uh, our plans had to, be, uh, had to be postponed because we had to deal with the immediate problems that had arisen. Looking um, at uh, the two years now uh, before the next uh, elections, what, what are the most uh, important things for you uh, to achieve? Is it in education? Is it in job creation, uh, is it in peace and reconciliation with the other groups that you still have armed conflicts with? Well, we always say that peace and prosperity cannot be divided. No. You can't have sustainable peace without prosperity and you can't have sustainable prosperity without peace. Mm. These two go together. So if we have to choose um, a pro uh, one priority target, it would be peace and prosperity together. Mm. We can't really divide the two. And of course, education is basic to both because it's through education that you teach the people to understand how to create peace in their own country and how to create prosperity. Mm. And education, I mean in a very broad sense, not just what we teach in the schools, but what, uh, what we, uh, it's, uh, it sounds a little um, arrogant to say teaching the people at large, but to give the people an opportunity to learn more about what kind of role they can play in um, building up peace and prosperity in the country. Looking at um, ASEAN and the relationship um, with uh, your neighbors, um, uh, it is said that uh, Myanmar is where India and China uh, meets. Um, uh, you're also involved in this um, uh, different in initiatives, uh, for example, also Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you see major uh, positive uh, results of this also for uh, Myanmar? 
Yes, of course. We've always been between China and India. It's yeah. not just that recently suddenly we find ourselves between China and India. This has been so since the world began. And uh, I think people uh, have forgotten that uh, we actually, Burma as an independent nation since 1948, had a very good record of, um, of well-balanced foreign relations. We've always had very good relations, not just with our two neighbors, with China and India, but also with the Western countries, including the ex-colonial power, and of course uh, with uh, our neighbors as well. United States too? The United States too. There was, uh, when we became, first became an independent nation, we were very much uh, supported, not just by our neighbors, but by um, the United States and by the Euro uh, European countries. And of course, now that ASEAN has been established, and I, I have to say that I take great, great pride in saying that um, uh, in one of my father's last speeches, it was in, just before he was assassinated in 1947, he talked about the possibility of a regional organization which is what ASEAN is now. So he was talk, thinking about that way back in 1947. And now that ASEAN is in place, we do want uh, to have more, not, not just friendly contacts, but practically mutually profitable contacts with our neighbors. Talking about uh, the US, you probably saw also Vice President Pence yesterday uh, appealed uh, to you and to Myanmar to let the two Reuters journalists uh, uh, out of, of jail. I think they got a sentence of uh, seven years. What, what is your response to Vice President Pence? Well, I think what I want to know is whether they feel that there has been a miscarriage of justice. Uh, the, the case has been held in open court, and all the hearings have been open to everybody who wished to go and attend them. And if anybody feels that there has been a miscarriage of justice, I would like them to point it out. Mm. And I wonder whether very many people have uh, actually read the, uh, the, the, the summary of the judgment, which had nothing to do with a freedom ex of expression at all. It had to do with the Official Secrets Act. But I, I don't think anybody has actually bothered to read it. Mm. And they should read the, the summary and point out. You've read it? Of course, we are obliged yeah. to read it, and uh, it, it would be, I think it would be very remiss of any member of the government not to have read it. But uh, I would like them to read the judgment and point out where they think there has been a miscarriage of justice, if there has been a miscarriage of justice. And you know, of course, that due process allows them to appeal the sentence. Mm. But I, I guess you also, as a democratic leader, um, um, don't feel comfortable with journalists being jailed? It's not a matter of, we, they were not jailed because they were journalists. Mm. They, were, they were jailed because the court has, well, sentence had been passed on them because the court has decided that they had broken the Official Secrets Act. Mm. So if we believe in the rule of law, they have every right to appeal the, the judgment mm. and to point out why the judgment is wrong if they consider it wrong. So, um, looking at, at Myanmar, second largest country in ASEAN, 50, more than 50 uh, million people, a uh, lot of aspirations still, uh, a lot of people uh, don't have access to electricity, there is still a lot of uh, development uh, issues. Uh, after two years, do you think you got uh, the support from the international development community as you expected? Where do you feel that uh, the international community can support more on Myanmar's uh, transition uh, into uh, then uh, in the future? I guess the aspiration is a middle-income country. Well, actually, with regard, you mentioned electrification. I think um, the improvement in electrification is one of the, uh, the um, our achievements that has been noted by the Myanmar Living Conditions Survey. Uh, the, uh, the improvement is very good and it's particularly good because it has taken part in rural areas. Mm -hmm. But with regard to whether we uh, have received as much development aid as we expected, I can't say that we expected development aid as such. We've always taken it for granted that one has to earn what one gets. 
and even aid and assistance has to be earned by what you are able to put in as well. It's not just sitting there and waiting for somebody to help you, but helping yourself so that there are others who feel that they would be happy to take part in the, in the enterprise as well. Now, for looking at this country in Vietnam, uh, as mentioned uh, in the Secretary General's uh, message yesterday, uh, there was like more than 50% um, poverty in this country uh, just a few decades ago. Uh, and now there is uh, only 3%. Um, are you expecting the same kind of uh, development in your country? And do you think you have the policies uh, to currently to, to achieve this? I think so. But, but of course, policy, policies don't stay static. Policies need to be changed. If, if, if uh, it is obvious that change is needed, we must, must, we must change and adapt. But uh, we are very impressed by what Vietnam has achieved. And, uh, and they've also shown that it's achievable. So uh, we're uh, getting uh, close to the end because there is a live TV uh, debate um, after us. But um, we are very pleased uh, to have you back at uh, our World Economic Forum Summit uh, in ASEAN. And um, my last question um, is uh, looking forward. Uh, the elections are coming up in uh, 2020. I guess you will be uh, running again as the leader of your uh, party. Where do you think, if you also win the elections in, in 2020, where, where do you think uh, Myanmar will be in 2025? Uh, what do you think you would, will achieve? Well, let's, let's get over one hump at a time. Yeah. I think first we've got to concentrate on winning the 2020 elections. And we want to win because we deserve to win, not because we want to win. And meaning to say that if we win the 2020 elections, I would like it to be because we have done enough for the country, for the people to accept that the party should continue to take responsibility. Um, of course, while one always wonders whether it's a good idea to want to win uh, the elections again and again, but part of, part of uh, the, the democratic process is that you work through a party system. So if you want to maintain the stability and, uh, and if you want to uh, continue with the development plans that you have laid down, then it, it becomes uh, important mm -hmm. to win the next elections. But I don't want that to be the be-all and the end-all uh, for our political party. Mm -hmm. We want to be part of the process of well, lifting our country out of poverty, mm -hmm. of bringing sustainable peace and progress and uh, prosperity. But in order to do that, practically speaking, it would be important to win the elections in 2020. And we just have to make sure that we make enough progress between now and then for the people to decide that they can safely continue to give us a responsibility to look after our country. Thank you. Thank you so much to Don Ansan Sushi, State Councillor. Thank you.